I was too harsh on Chrome when I made a video about it originally, however many years ago that was. Probably 50% of that was for the sake of comedy, and the other 50% was born of a desire to avoid nostalgia bias. Well, if I've learned anything doing YouTube for seven years, it's that I'm never wrong and I have no bias. Specforce Chrome was developed by Techland like the first game, but they couldn't get or didn't want publisher support from Strategy First. Specforce was self-published by Techland themselves, as far as I can tell. That's a bit of a disadvantage on the budget game shelf. I know a lot of my purchasing decisions as a youth were informed by publisher. Strategy First in particular were a reliable source of quality games, like Disciples, Kohan Immortal Sovereigns, Jagged Freaking Alliance, Celtic Kings, so it's safe to say when I saw their logo on Chrome, it had at least some influence. As much as I loved Chrome, I never played Specforce because at the time, I didn't know it existed. I never saw Specforce on the shelf anywhere, probably because it was self-published by Techland. I'm sure their distributor didn't have the reach of Strategy First. To recap the previous game before we begin, here's some things that I loved about Chrome. Something I talked about in the original video, but that really struck me when I played it again, is that the interior areas are all laid out in a very realistic way. They're not just a linear series of corridors flaked by real fake doors on all sides. They have a sense of place. The buildings are laid out sensibly and have generator rooms, storage rooms, multiple elevators, and usually entrances and exits. This dedication to believable interior spaces went even further, and the interiors of buildings had trash cans, vending machines, empty drinks and snacks, and just stuff lying around. It was necessarily sparse due to the technology of the time, but it felt lived in. I'm much less impressed now by games like Human Revolution and Mankind Divided that put way too much clutter in every single level. When I sneak into an office building and there's the exact same spilled cup of coffee on every single desk, I don't think, wow, look at that detail. I think, wow, look at how little respect they have for the audience. The combat in Chrome is not nearly as sparse as I remember it being. I don't think I realized it before, but going prone is a really effective combat strategy in the game to quickly regain accuracy after moving. It gives the close combat a bit of a Taken or John Woo feeling, where you hit the deck as enemies enter a room to make your spray of automatic fire more effective. Going prone also helps you stop in a hurry because the game has a very floaty movement system. It feels like playing a third person game from first person. It fits the realism of the game, but when you don't have body awareness, it just feels like your character is drunk. Look at me, walking good. Whoa, 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 whoa. Ice skating around indoors is a pain in the ass, like when you try to walk up to a computer console and overshoot it by several feet, then do a 180 and start Looney Tunes running in place for a few seconds before changing direction. The weird movement momentum in this game does have a weird side effect. If you're running at speed and hit the crouch button, you can actually slide for like 10 or 15 feet. Once you get the hang of it, it's pretty fucking badass to do a slow motion knee slide around a corner with a shotgun and it actually works. I also appreciate that the game has a smart inventory layout. It seems to have been designed cleverly to prevent certain weapon combinations, but to allow specific other weapon combinations. For example, the shotgun is a secondary weapon at best due to the normally very long engagement distances in the game. It's a compact, pistol grip only shotgun in the style of a Mossberg Persuader. Pro tip, these suck noodle in real life. So you can carry one as a backup to your sniper rifle, assault rifle, or heavy weapon. I also like how you carry boxes of ammo in your inventory. In the original Deus Ex, which Chrome was clearly borrowing a few elements from, ammo was a separate inventory. Chrome also has good weapons. I mentioned the cohesive design style of the weapons in my original video, but I didn't talk about how well they work together. The basic assault rifle is kind of boring, but it's supposed to be. As a bread and butter weapon, it's effective at mid-range and will do the trick up close. Because this is a post-Halo sci-fi game, it's a bullpup, it's in a way too big caliber, and it's got a digital ammo counter. Nice. The SMG is also boring, but in a way that supplements the assault rifle nicely. A lot of the other guns I really like. My favorite is either the 12mm revolver, which pairs beautifully with the slow motion implant for close quarters combat, or the Zatron Mark IV 14mm hunting rifle, which has in-universe advertisements that get you psyched up for it before you even find one. I also like that there are a few common gun manufacturers in the game that each make a few guns. It's good that the guns are fun to use, because Chrome was a little too miserly with the OCS, the item that clears your implant overload meter. You basically never get more than one or two of these per level for the entire game, and as I recall, you never find them on dead enemies. Even as the implants assimilate and you overload slower, you're always micromanaging them for short bursts. It works fine and keeps them from being too powerful, but there are times where I wish they'd let you cut loose with the implants and go nuts. 
As I did mention, the implants are all useful. None of it is bullshit. The eye scope lets you zoom in a bit, and the accuracy booster narrows your reticle. This can be useful when trying to snipe with a non-scoped weapon in a mid-range fight, but it's also really useful to improve headshots with a silent pistol when you're trying to be stealthy. And yeah, the game doesn't really make stealth a viable option for more than the first one or two enemies in an area, but I am okay with that. I do like the stealth in games like Chrome and Far Cry 2 more than the modern interpretation of ultra-easy brain-dead stealth. If you can pull off some stealth kills in Chrome or Far Cry 2, you soften up the enemy for when the shooting starts. And they're all the more satisfying because they're earned. Granted, this is just my style of gameplay. I don't want to play pure stealth or pure action because I get bored easily. You still use the implants constantly to give you an edge, they just don't seem to be all that powerful. All the stuff lifted from detail. Deus Ex is there, like oh, dermal armor, the adrenal processor to help you get through the long outdoor walking segments without wanting to die, and also the weird HMN vision, or I guess human vision that highlights bad guys. This implant is what makes the stealth levels possible. I guess I never really used the recoil reducer implant, but I did use the shit out of the good old reflex booster. Of course I love the reflex booster. I summarized the entire game last time by saying it has slow motion mech combat and that's enough. Well, it kind of is. The reflex booster is just plain awesome, and the fact that you can use it while in vehicles just adds to the magnificence. Early 2000s ragdoll is better fun than parkour failed compilations on YouTube, and watching it play out in slow motion is even better. I had a great time replaying Chrome for this video. It really has held up well, and I still love the game. One of the things that keeps me from doing more Budget Barrel episodes is that I'm not totally sure the games I want to cover are budget games. It's hard to find what the MSRP of a game was 20 years ago, so I have to rely on my imperfect memory. Some games I clearly remember, like buying Breed and Chrome for 15 bucks a pop in the electronics section of the local department store. The reason I bring this up is that I no longer have my original boxed copy of Chrome, so at the time I reviewed it, I just had the discs. It's a really hard game to find for some reason, but I checked eBay obsessively every few weeks since I released that video and finally found one in late 2016. And here it is with a price tag of $40. So Chrome wasn't really a budget game, it was a middle market game, and treating those the same as budget shovelware is frankly uncharitable. Spec Force is easy to find since it came in a plastic keep case and nobody fucking bought it, but the original box for Chrome is one of my favorites. The front is a cool embossed scene of mechs and armored bad guys, with Carrie and Logan resplendent behind a shiny Chrome logo. It's a slick cover. Inside the gatefold are a lot of big juicy screenshots showing off the graphics and features. 20 kinds of weapons. Yeah boy, that's my jam. The pictures show the beautiful savanna and jungle environments, the cool armored enemies, the vehicles you get to play with, and the ad copy touts the stealth and action gameplay. The back shows the mechs off again and has some mouth-watering copy about weapons, implants, vehicles, and environments. Damn, I am not sure how it's possible to see Chrome on the shelf for 20 bucks and not buy it. Alright, maybe I'd think twice at 40 bucks. Basically, that's my serious review of Chrome. If in my original video about Chrome I gave you the impression the game was bad or not worth your time, then I apologize. I didn't do that intentionally, and you should definitely play Chrome to see where Far Cry got all their ideas. Well, anyway, that's the fun part, and now we have to talk about Spec Force. Let's check out that box. Spec Force Chrome, or Chrome Spec Force, I'm not sure which, comes in a double wide DVD case with a generic armor guy on the front. Okie doke. On to the back. Special Forces of the Future. You are Bolt Logan, a member of the elite Spec Force military unit. Hey boss, what should we call this new Special Forces unit? I know, we'll call them Spec Force Unit. Jesus. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, to battle terrorist factions on the desolate planet of Estrella. But things turn from bad to worse when the local conflict escalates to pan-galactic gargle blaster proportions. And you're in the middle of it all. How about them screenshots? Assaults form the air. Oops, Ponglish strikes again. Infantry versus mech-like walkers battles. Mech-like walkers. Those sound similar to but legally distinct from mechs. Spectacular chases. This screenshot looks kind of like the Return of the Jedi speeder chase. I hope this actually happens and is actually cool. The original Chrome had a pretty high octane vehicle segment that was fun. The rest of the blurbs on the back are pretty standard, but I ordered a second copy of Spec Force because my original didn't include a manual and thus no CD key. The second copy is a slimline Euro DVD case that has a bonus screenshot on the back. Squad and self-contained missions. Aside from the training prologue, Chrome was entirely made up of, uh, self-contained missions, although there were plenty of friendly NPCs in the background. 
In Spec Force Chrome, you once again play as Bolt Logan, which was a terrible name in 2003, but has aged very well in contrast to the Mason Mafia that have the market on video game protagonists pretty much covered. After the intro mission of Chrome, Logan gets augmented, or implanted, during the one-year flash forward. Back in the bad old days on Spec Force with Pointer, Logan wasn't implanted, so that's a big strike against the prequel. Implants were used sparingly in the first game, but they were still important to the plot and gameplay. But if only there was a way to wave your hand and make it all go away. Ah yes, power armor. Bolt Logan of Spec Force has a suit of power armor, which gives him abilities like power shields, neural boost, motion support, and active camo. These are nothing like the Dermal Armor, Reflex Booster, Adrenal Processor, and Active Camo items of the previous game. Seriously though, I don't really mind. The universe of Chrome follows in the vein of the first Deus Ex, showing how much more efficient the new implant tech is than the old clunky power armor. Spec Force opens on a training level in a very brown forest where Logan learns how to use his power suit. Okay, Logan, I see you got your power suit. Alright, sorry, I don't think anybody finds that as funny as I do. The power suit is the same as the old implant system, but pared down a bit, and all the abilities are available immediately. The old eye scope and targeting assist have been removed in favor of an automatic zoom in with any gun when you aim it. The recoil reducer and HMN vision are gone. The armor has a built-in version of the cloaking device from the first game. Instead of implants overloading your system and OCS packs clearing your overload, the armor draws from a power bar and the blue battery item restores your power to full. Totally different system. See, instead of abilities filling the bar and an item for clearing the bar, the item fills the bar and abilities clear it. Completely different and original. This system is not quite as usable as the first game because you don't generate power automatically. If you run out of batteries and run out of power, you just can't use the abilities. And they're way more important than before because instead of dropping you into a big Far Cry map to engage or disengage enemies at your discretion, Spec Force just swarms you with tons of bad guys in an annoying brown shooting gallery. This means no more consequence free use of the speed boost to get through open areas. After getting trained, the real fun begins. We find Logan and Pointer at the height of their friendship on a mission to destroy drug stockpiles made by the sinister Lord Gen mercenary group. Logan is suspiciously quiet, and even though you and Pointer are the boots on the ground for the mission, your commander is the one who does all the talking. When Logan and Pointer do speak, it's not very much, and it's pretty clear the voice actors aren't the same guys and aren't as good as the original voice cast. Chrome was a solid game and it even had some personality, thanks to a lot of dialogue featuring John St. John and some other semi-charismatic voices. Spec Force Chrome has a lot of monologue featuring, I think, one or two guys doing variations on a theme in the key of gruff. Working with Pointer sucks because he likes to get killed and then you fail the mission. He also says he'll cover you multiple times with a sniper rifle, but then he doesn't shoot anybody. Pointer and Logan plant demo charges to blow up a drug base, but before they can be extracted, their shuttle is ambushed and destroyed, leaving them stranded on a hostile planet. In the next mission, they try to steal a shuttle, which means a stealth, quote-unquote, segment, where in order to not fail instantly, you have to stick to Pointer like you've been JB welded to his armor. This is bad, but at least it's not as frustrating as the instant fail stealth mission that was nigh impossible in the first game. I mean, it's boring, and pointless, and basically just a fugly, non-cinematic, completely unimmersive version of the scripted linear stealth from Modern Warfare, but you can get through it without much time or effort. Pointer and Logan get pinned down in the shuttle hangar, but are rescued by another guy with the same character model and voice as Pointer, Logan, and every bad guy in the fucking level. Check this out, I almost shot Pointer when he ran inside the hangar unannounced because he looks like an enemy and was being followed by two other enemies. The game is so monochrome and dingy, especially compared to Chrome which was bright and beautiful. Your rescuer, Cartwright, tells you he's a resistance fighter and can lead you to safety. Are you FSB? Not quite, I'm a civilian. And thus follows an epic speeder bike chase through the woods. Yeah, I'm kidding. This game is fucking awful, and it's all the fault of this speeder bike mission. You wind your way through every square inch of the map on the speeder following your buddies. If you hit anything, your bike comes to a complete halt and takes damage. You pass numerous enemies throughout the level, all of whom get free hits on you. 
There's no way to avoid damage, you just have to get lucky enough not to sustain so much damage that the speeder dies, because then you fail. Vehicle health is displayed on the left side of the screen, and you might feel pretty comfortable seeing how slowly it ticks down and you get shot. But the speeder is destroyed when it hits 20% health, so there's a fifth of your health you can't actually use. To make matters worse, the game doesn't seem to realize you can't avoid taking damage. Don't slow down. Oh really, motherfucker? You basically can't even quick save during this mission because if you do, you'll get locked into an unwinnable scenario because you don't have enough health left to get through the unavoidable damage later on. This is the worst shit ever. Do I want to restart and do this whole mission again? No. I really don't, but I could always cheat like crazy. A simple god mode cheat won't suffice, because that doesn't prevent the vehicle from getting destroyed and you failing the mission that way. So it's time to map hole my way to victory. Apparently the planet Estrella is home to the Resistance, who are fighting against the Corporation. Oh boy, that shit again. It doesn't make sense how big Lorgen is in this game, and it doesn't make sense why the Resistance is there or why they're fighting. There's no indication that this was a colonized planet that Lorgen took over to make drugs, so I'm not sure where the Resistance is meant to have come from, or why they don't just leave. The Resistance tells you Lorgen isn't just selling drugs to the Mafia, they're also studying the local wildlife to do super soldier research Research. A corporation, a resistance, and a side plot about genetic modification and super soldiers. Fuck all this basic shit. The local wildlife in this game is also the same little dinosaurs and shit from Chrome, so I'm sure they could do this research anywhere. In the next level, Cartwright briefs Logan about Lord Jen's commander on the planet, General Stanton. So called because he was never in the military and isn't actually a general. Just when the story is in danger of being fleshed out a bit, Lord Gen mercs attack and suddenly you're in a defense mission. It's nowhere near as impactful as the colony defense missions in Chrome, because there's no buildup and the level design and execution is sloppy. And your allies love to shoot you in the fucking back. It's still got the same kind of pacing as the defense missions in Chrome. You hold the line against the infantry assault, throw EMP grenades at enemy armor support, then zoom off in the old standby RMG Conquistador to help out somewhere else. The EMP grenades take the place of the cluster grenades from the last game and emit a cloud of amber smoke when they go off. Kind of looks like chaff and not an electromagnetic pulse, but I have a liberal arts degree, so what do I know? Instead of causing the enemy vehicles to shut down, the so-called EMP grenades cause them to explode spectacularly. I don't think that's how EMP works, but again, what do I know? One of my favorite moments in Chrome was riding a dropship between outposts in real time while shooting rockets out the back at bad guys and the local fauna. You don't get to do that in Spec Force, and the levels are much smaller and more closed in than in Chrome. After successfully defending the Rebel base, Pointer, Logan, and two Resistance members named Bill and Bob go on a mission to ambush a convoy transporting three Rebel prisoners. I didn't make up those names as a joke, by the way. Your Rebel squad mates are actually named Bill and Bob. Appropriately, Pointer takes point in this mission, which means you don't have to do any thinking of your own. On the way to the ambush spot, you move through a swamp where Lorgen have been researching dinosaurs. I think this was supposed to be spooky and atmospheric with dinosaurs charging out of the mist at you. It ends up being goofy more than anything. During the convoy ambush, Bob and Bill are both killed, which means Logan has to do all the heavy lifting as always. Then he and Pointer hop in the transporter and drive the three rebel prisoners to safety. Hmm, risking four soldiers and losing two to rescue three soldiers. This doesn't seem like a wise use of manpower, although I guess they technically came out ahead. Bill and Bob were good men. They fought hard, I'll give them that. Well, I hope the three guys we rescued were also good. And then, strangely, the game starts getting good. In the next mission, Logan assaults a mountain stronghold to upload a virus into the Lorgen computer. It's got a lot of annoying level design that funnels you down tiny green corridors, which really undercuts the open visuals of the levels. But the base assault is classic chrome. Soften it up with a sniping binge and then go in guns blazing. I tried using the always available cloaking armor ability to stealth parts of this level, but it doesn't really work. There are no silenced weapons anymore and no knife, so you can sneak up to a guy, but then you have to unload on him with your assault rifle. So you can't keep the stealth going after more than a few seconds. The base assault level introduces new enemies, bald ninja ladies who can cloak and move really fast. You might recognize them from Half-Life 1. There are also huge canyon sections where you can have sniper duels and get attacked by what are basically the man hacks from Half-Life 2, or perhaps more appropriately the floating laser drones from Fear. 
This level does wear on a bit, and there's a lot of linear trudging through narrow canyons or on narrow paths at the top of big ravines. But there's still some classic Chrome gameplay in here, and I actually quite liked it. After uploading the virus, Logan heads for the dust-off point where Pointer waits for him. But little does he know, Pointer is a good guy and picks him up without incident. This game does very little to establish Pointer as a psycho renegade, despite the plot of Chrome, and the manual of Chrome telling us how unstable he is. With the Lorgen system all virused up, the rebels prepare to make an all-out assault against Lorgen. Logan and his team attack an anti-air post, while the other teams make a two-pronged assault on the main base. This is another pretty solid level. I was prepared to dump on this game for 20 minutes straight, but then it up and got good on me. There's a lot of large-scale combat in this mission between big groups of Rebels and Lorgen Mercs. I still can't really tell them apart at a distance, but whatever. It's good stuff, and the mission doesn't end prematurely even if the Rebels drop like flies, which they do. After capturing the AA outpost, Logan mans the gun and shoots down incoming Lorgen shuttles, which is lightweight but entertaining mid-2000s gameplay. Turret segment, check. Wave defense, check. Then you hop on the RMG Conquistador, one of my favorite video game gun buggies, and zip over to help out the other guys. When you arrive, their attack on the main gate has stalled out, so you hop in a heavy walker and go to town. Spec Force is much freer with the mechs than Chrome was. They let you have one on almost every level. Unlike in Chrome, they seem to immediately regret it and spam you with rocket launcher enemies and other vehicles, so the mech only lasts about 40 seconds. When you start getting hit, the big clouds of black smoke make it impossible to fight back, and then before you know it, the mech's down and you're back on foot. Even if you do manage to survive the combat, you'll have to get off in short order to navigate your way around a barricade or find an alternative route past a blown bridge. In this assault level, they let you have some real fun with the mechs. Unfortunately, it's the Type B variant of the heavy mech, which has two independently fired rocket launchers that take a long time to reload. The normal variant of the heavy mech has twin machine guns and twin rocket launchers. It's way more fun and you barely get to use it. After Logan and one of the random rebels whose name and face I don't recognize assault the gate, they have to move into the facility. This rebel, named... Kraft? Weber? Kingsford? Something like that? Anyway, he's the only mission-critical rebel, so you have to work to keep him alive. Easier said than done, because he doesn't have much survival instinct, and the enemies are very apt at shooting protruding elbows and toes from behind cover. The last three levels of this game are a grindhouse murder festival through the narrow corridors of Lord Jen's subterranean base. Your mission is to kill the commander, evil General Stanton, who is apparently ruthless and powerful, but who we've only heard about once before now. Logan fights his way solo through the facility, destroys their stockpile of super soldier drugs, and kills their small cadre of drug-fueled power armor wearing super soldiers. These guys aren't fun to fight. They have a shitload of health and can move really fast, but the best way to fight them is just to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, turn the armor boost ability on, pop a heal text or two, and trade shots until they die. Logan also slaughters hundreds of Lorgen security guards, who look like normal guys in blue riot gear, but actually have more health than the armored soldiers from the rest of the game. I was so happy to see a visually distinct enemy type that I didn't care. The facility is also staffed by unarmed scientists, who you can kill with no repercussions. Actually, I think you're encouraged to shoot them because they carry heal text items. In the depths of the facility, Logan encounters General Stanton who runs away. The final level is another slow grind through the above ground facility until you fight against Stanton in a big arena. He's got the same abilities as the super soldiers. Lots of health, super speed, and cloaking. Luckily, he mostly sticks to the center of the arena so you can roam between the weapon caches around the perimeter and then chuck a stream of hand grenades at him. After he dies, the rebels tell you that the rest of Lorgen is surrendering. You won! Faceless, laconic Logan poses triumphantly over the body of faceless, generic Stanton as the rebels celebrate. Job well done. Well, job done, anyway. We are then treated to a little cutscene listening to some high-ranking evil government guy who assures whoever he's talking to that everything is proceeding exactly as planned. Ooh, ominous sequel hook. Except the sequel came out before this game, and there's no super soldier bullshit in Chrome at all. Aside from one pretty good level and one really good level, this game sucks. Half of that is bad storytelling. Everybody wears helmets and has no personality, so you're not invested in the mission content of the game. Chrome was a bit cheesy and the evil corporations were a bit generic. Cortec, Zetrox, Spacon, but they were colorful and you talked to people with unique faces and voices for each. 
Spec Force does not have pre-mission briefings or cutscenes. Your mission information is only contained on the loading screen, which doesn't set up the world or your objectives as well as a cutscene with dialogue would. I hesitate to say this game has characters. Even the rebels with names only have a handful of lines during the missions. Look at the difference here. In Chrome, when a character talks, there's a big animated portrait that pops up, and the dialogue is big. The important characters also all have different costumes and different looks. Pointer has his gray crew cut and metal arms. Logan has his cool space jacket. All five of Logan's ladies have distinct costume design and identifiable faces. Spec Force has, I think, a total of five character models. One for characters with power armor, one for riot police, one for bald ninja ladies, one for scientists, and one for rebels. Pointer is portrayed in the backstory of Chrome and the game itself as an unstable psychopath, a maverick who goes rogue and fucks shit up. In Spec Force, though, the dude is solid. He's a competent guy who demonstrates smart tactics and mourns the loss of his men. A prequel about Logan and Pointer in Spec Force could have actually been a good idea, showing Pointer becoming increasingly unstable leading up to the injury that cost him his arms before the first game. I'd play that. This story is spinning its wheels and going nowhere, and it isn't even rescued by the gameplay. The encounter design is straight up mid-2000s. You kill enemies on the way to a spot, then defend the spot against waves. Fucking waves. Enemy waves were omnipresent in the mid-2000s. Just another on the long list of things that nearly killed the fucking shooter genre. Just below explosive barrels and above linear vehicle segments. You kill a frankly implausible number of bad guys in this game. It doesn't have the scale of Chrome, but it has way more bodies, so the enemy density is through the fucking roof. Enemies pour out of nooks and crannies they should not logically be in, and it just strains belief that there are so many of them in small areas. Chrome certainly had a body count, but the enemies were spaced intelligently. This kind of spawn closet bullshit is also on the aforementioned shit list, tied with turret segments. I think this is why they nixed the heartbeat tracker from the first game. Chrome had a half-circle radar dish at the bottom center of the screen, which is an ever-present part of the gameplay. The radar pulsed and only revealed enemies during that pulse. It also only covered the area directly in front of you, so you could use it to scan for enemies directly ahead, but it didn't give you full situational awareness. And if you changed orientation between pulses, the blips didn't magically update. It was extremely useful for fighting enemies in the lush environments and indoor areas, but without being overpowered. Spec Force doesn't have that, maybe because it would be painfully obvious when enemies spawned just out of sight. Instead, it gives you an enemy highlighting effect similar to the rifle scopes in the first game, but always on. It's very unreliable and does not help in locating the enemies that shoot you from behind foliage. Well, let me cheer myself up by talking about guns for a minute. Or ten. The tried-and-true Matson Calf's Bullpup rifle has been replaced by a generic, chunky, boring rifle. It looks like the 14mm heavy rifle from the first game, which has itself been remodeled in this game to look like a chunky Bullpup SMG. So both of those suck. The new grenade launcher weapon takes rocket ammo and literally lobs rockets on a time-delay fuse. It looks like it was modeled and animated in a real hurry and replaces the cool, heavy wave-motion cannon thing from the first game. Another step down. The pistol from the original game is the same, minus the lamb or whatever that was attached to the old one. The guns are way less satisfying in Spec Force. Part of it is the bland, chunky redesigns. The pistol especially seems really cheaply animated. It's basically unchanged from the first game, but the way Logan shoots it almost one-handed makes it look like they couldn't be bothered to animate anything but the slide. Spec Force doesn't have ejecting brass, and neither did Chrome, but it's way more noticeable in this game. I just can't shake it, it all looks so bad. The cool cruiser-style shotgun from Chrome has been replaced with a new, ugly shotgun that still functions the same. The two sniper rifles from the first game are still here, which seems unnecessary, and the 14mm hunting rifle is still widely available. I don't like it as much in this game because it's not well suited to the massive shootouts. In Chrome, it was great for mid-range sniping against the small patrol, but in Spec Force, it's largely unnecessary. You can get perfectly cromulent mid-range accuracy just by going into aim mode with a standard rifle. The electric cannon from Chrome is also gone, replaced with nothing. And as mentioned, the silenced weapons were removed entirely. You don't even get to pick your gear between missions anymore, which is annoying. Sometimes you carry over what you had on the last mission, and sometimes you get a generic set of assault rifle and pistol. Spec Force gives you a much bigger main inventory block to work with, so you can pair up multiple primary weapons. I still like that you have a sort of rough approximation of load-bearing equipment in this inventory system. Small pockets can hold a grenade or two health items. The medium pockets are sized for ammo, and you have one big holster pocket which can fit any of the sidearms. 
The game can give you a lot of space for grenades, ammo, and consumables without letting you load up on tons of long arms. One of the complaints about Chrome is that you always get resupplied after every fight by looting guns, ammo, consumables, and grenades off the bad guys. I kind of understand the complaint, but it really helps along your suspension of disbelief. How does one guy massacre 50 armored troopers in one level? Well, he gets fresh supplies off of every guy and only encounters them a few at a time. This doesn't work to the same extent in Spec Force because each encounter is implausibly large and there are way too many encounters. But still, I like scrounging bodies for equipment after every fight. That's probably why I like Stalker so much. Of course, the enemies in Spec Force react way too fast and are way too accurate, so you take a shitload of damage in every fight, pretty much regardless of how you use cover. Combine the huge enemy count with the expanded inventory size, and the result is that I spent most of the game packing around 20 health items at all times. And that's it. That's Spec Force. There's no reason to play this game. None whatsoever. If you're a fan of the original Chrome, this will just piss you off and won't do anything new. If you're not a fan of Chrome, this game is worse in every measurable way, so it certainly isn't going to convince you. A note about compatibility. Chrome installs and runs on Windows 10 with no issues, but for Spec Force, the copy protection wouldn't allow the game to launch. So in order to get this game to run, I had to use a no CD crack. I would have played them both on an XP machine, but my capture card is all jacked up right now. Luckily, they did okay in Windows 10, although Spec Force did crash a couple times. We're under heavy fire. I don't know if you're at home. What about you? Of course, that information shouldn't be valuable to you because you should have played Chrome after my original video, and you shouldn't play Spec Force ever. Thanks for watching. See you next time. I've got to mention the pluck hubs of this copy of Chrome real quick. Whoever made this was so proud of the mechanism they branded it. M. Locking Mechanism. Now, one of these pluck hubs works super great. The other one is broken, and it is impossible to get the fucking CD back in there. I won't rate this as the worst pluck hub design ever, but it is the most fragile, and I am quite the pluck hub connoisseur. I'll also share most of my CD key with you, since I suspect if you have any interest in Spec Force, you've already got a copy of your own. Sex. Fap. Nice.